Well, thank you for that very generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be back in Oslo again. I used to be a, a regular visitor here. Um, I'm, as was said, I, I like to work in both the world of academia and the world of practice. I like to do academic research, and I also like to speak to and consult to uh, ex executives. Uh, today's talk is much more directed, if you like, to the executives in the room, to the people who are running businesses. There's a lot of academic research underneath this, uh, but for the sake of this talk and the time we've got, I'm going to be kind of downplaying that bit. So, uh, for those of you who are academics, if you want to ask me any academic questions, feel free to do so after I've done my talk. But I'm going to be focusing this much more on the big picture challenges and opportunities that I think organizations, uh, large and small, face. And my title really is to think about how we can make our companies, our organizations, fit for the future. Uh, I'm going to start with a little uh, teaser, a question for you to, to get you thinking. Uh, this is data that's collected annually in, in America, in, certainly in the UK, certainly in Australia. Maybe there's a, a Norwegian version, I haven't found it yet. Uh, and people are asked how they rate the honesty of a set of professions. Um, you can probably guess where I'm heading with this. It's not, it is not a pretty picture. Uh, the business executives are not quite at the bottom. You're still ahead of the, the car salesman, but you're behind the lawyers, the bankers, the journalists, and so forth. Uh, lots of reasons for this, and this is, this is recent data. I mean, I, I update this slide annually. This data is now about 18 months old, but I'm pretty sure the story is quite consistent. There is a, there is a problem in the world's perception, the public perception of the world of big business, and there's lots of reasons for that. One of them is that as we look across industries, we see big established companies in, 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 in a wide variety of industries. You'll recognize these there are many others we could also put onto the list, where companies are not performing as consistently as they were. Big companies like BP in the UK, all the banks, you know the list, uh, have had major crises. And as a result, I think, when, when companies get into trouble, the public starts to kind of feel that somehow the whole cadre of business executives are not quite as ethical and upstanding and as, um, with, with perhaps less integrity than they, than they should have. And I, and I think that's wrong, but the point is, if the public believes that, there, there is an issue, because we, as, as people who are influential in the business world, have to restore our legitimacy to that public to be able to, to continue to have influence. And if you don't believe me that the world, as it were, is getting more difficult, uh, more challenging, here is just one, one piece of data where we've we kind of correlated performance in one year of the top 500 companies and we correlated that with performance four and then seven years afterwards. In other words, to what extent does past performance predict future performance? And all this chart says, the one takeaway here, is that the correlation between past and future performance is going down. It's going down quite steeply. What that says is there's a greater turnover of the companies at the top of the pile. And almost by definition, what that means is that previously successful companies are losing out more often than they used to. Incumbency is no longer uh, a guarantee, if you like, of future performance. So that's, that's a problem, and it's a, it's a challenge. There's lots of reasons for that. I'm just going to focus on one. Here is a, you know, a, simple, a simple slide. It shows that over the years, a certain variable, which I'm about to reveal for you, has experienced exponential growth. That variable is bank exposure to credit default swaps. Now, you may not even remember what exactly a credit default swap is, and that doesn't really matter. The point is that that went up dramatically, and of course that led to the credit crisis. And, and, my, and my underlying point here is a very simple one, which is that when something grows at an exponential rate, and we as business people, even if, even if we're only exposed in a sort of second-order way, if we are exposed to an exponential growth in something, and our own management processes, our own way of thinking about things, only goes up at a much more shallow rate, inevitably there is a gap, and our capacity to adapt is simply, is simply found wanting. And of course, this trend, if you like, this exponential trend, can be seen in many areas of technology and, and some of the consequences of technology. The point, in a simple way of saying it, is that the companies are, required, are, re are being required to become more, more agile. And I don't think, this is to get to where I'm heading, I don't think the way that we are currently managed and organized in big companies particularly, 
and to some degree even in small companies, is able to cope with these exponential changes. Here is another a nice, nice slide just to illustrate this, and then, I'll, and then I'll move on to the substance. I took this from Atlantic Monthly. What they did was they documented the speed with which various technologies had actually hit essentially 100% of households. This is American data. There's the telephone over a century. Radio started obviously a bit later and got to the, to the 100% so exposure much more quickly. You can see where I'm heading here. Color TV uh, much later in starting, but of course the speed with which it rolled out grew. You've got the computer and you've got the mobile phone. And of course nowadays, you know, the percentage of people with mobile phones is actually more than 100%. I suspect if I did a poll, several of you in the room would, would admit to having two or even three of these devices. So we've got a very, very rapidly increasing rollout of technologies. And I don't know if you remember this guy. He was all the rage last year, wasn't he? He's now kind of disappeared again. But it took six months for this guy to, Sai, his name was PSY, to go from being a completely unheard of guy outside of Korea to be having one billion views uh, on YouTube. Uh, and of course, we know exactly what's going on here, the viral nature of, of, of information uh, dissemination allowed this guy, as I say, to become world famous uh, from a standing start in less than a year. So, so there's, there's a lot of stuff happening, and, and I guess we all experience this in its different shapes and forms. What's my kind of contribution to this? Uh, it is the following. It is to say that firms need to find better ways of responding to this world of accelerating change. Uh, it was mentioned that I founded with Gary Hamill a thing we call the M-Lab, the Management Innovation Lab Laboratory. And the purpose of that lab was, was very simple. We said to ourselves, we as academics shouldn't be just viewing companies from afar. We should actually be working with companies to help them to become better at managing. And the kind of the, the aha moment we had, and this was six or seven years ago now, was that when we talk about innovation, we often obsess about technology innovation. We often obsess about the latest iPad or iPod or whatever it is as a product innovation. That's the stuff that we can physically hold on to. But if you think about it for more than a few seconds, you realize that innovation as a concept applies, of course, to any aspect of the, the things that we do, the products we sell, and the ways that we work. So our management innovation lab was all about enlarging our view of innovation so that innovation becomes uh, an, an investigation into how we can work more effectively rather than just in terms of the products or services that we make. So that I, I, I came up with this concept of management innovation as a sort, of an, a sort of an often ignored aspect of innovation that we should be taking seriously as academics as well as as business people. Now, does management innovation have any impact? Surely the companies that succeed, succeed because of the products or services that they sell. Well, actually, when you go back and look at certain industries, you can see an interesting story emerge. This is the car industry. And if you take a 100-year view of the car industry, and you say to yourself, which were the leading companies in any era and what led them to become successful, an interesting pattern emerges. And I'll do this story very quickly because it's quite a, a well-established story. Ford Motor Company, what was their biggest invention? Was it the Model T Ford? I would argue it was the assembly line that allowed them to create the Model T Ford at unprecedentedly low cost. They managed to create a product for the masses through innovations in process, innovations in how they created the product. Ford had the leadership of that industry for 20 odd years. Then, of course, General Motors uh, and Alfred P. Sloan is that chap there, uh, in the 1930s took leadership from Ford. How did they do that? Well, those of you who are students of business know this story. You know, Alfred P. Sloan's big invention was arguably the multi-divisional structure, you know, a, a simple structural innovation that said we are going to decentralize the management of the various different brands from Chevrolet to Oldsmobile to Cadillac into essentially operating companies. And we at the center are going to keep control of a few things like the money and so forth. Now, of course, today that's just the standard way of organizing any big company. But the point is that innovation around how we organize came from Sloan and a couple of other companies in the 1930s. For the academics in the room, of course, this is Alfred Chandler's uh, famous book 
was the thing that kind of documented how this em evolution emerged. So that's the second era, and of course I think you can probably guess where I'm going with the third era, which is Toyota. And Toyota's leadership of the, of the car industry started in the 70s, arguably still is going on to this day. And Toyota's innovation, of course, was the whole thing which we now call total quality management or lean manufacturing. The idea that if we invest in the problem-solving skills of our employees, we will get a return on that investment. We give the employees the skills, the capability, we give them the authority to stop the line if the cars are not coming off the line uh, in a high-quality way. And that innovation has allowed them, again, to get high, very high levels of both quality as well as low cost at the same time. So we see an industry where management innovation has been the underlying driver of changes in leadership. So for me, management innovation is important. It's something that has not, we have not spent as much time thinking about as we should. And it's something that I think we can actually uh, do much more and much better research on. I don't want to just think about management innovation as something we should do for the better, as it were, of society. I also have a much more kind of practical, almost personal view as to why management innovation is important. Uh, you recognize the uh, pointy head cartoons. You may recognize this is the American version of a, of a sitcom, a situation comedy called The Office. There was a British version as well. And the point of both of these two um, cartoons, if you like, is that the boss is an idiot. The boss is a half-wit. The people who work for the boss are far smarter and are far more adept than the idiot who is their boss. And they spend a lot of time, they delight in, in, in making fun of him, mocking him. And of course, the only reason this is funny is because it has some semblance in truth. We've all recognized at some point in our careers uh, bosses who we didn't think much of, bosses who were micromanagers, bosses who tried to take all the glory when everything worked, bosses who didn't even understand what we were doing. Alas, there is some truth to that, and I'll just give you one more piece of evidence, if you like. This is a, another little quiz. Uh, this is data that I stole from an economist in London. Who are you happiest spending time with? He studies happiness. I was reading, actually, I'm, I'm sure you saw this story. Norway is the, the most happy, prosperous country in the world, according to certain statistics. At a much more micro level, uh, it turns out that we are happiest with our friends, our parents, and so forth. Once again, I'm going to draw your attention to the bottom of this chart. Uh, let me just spell it out for you in case you haven't got the point. We are happier alone. We are happy speaking to nobody <laughs> than hanging out with our boss. And if you think about it, that's a bit depressing because for us, most of us, you know, the boss is somebody who's kind of around us all the time. You know, if we could have a good relationship with our boss, he or she would be happy, we'd be happier. But the evidence says that on average, we would prefer to be locked away in a dark corner <laughs> rather than spending time with him. So that's, that is emblematic of a bigger kind of malaise in big organizations. This is particularly a big organization phenomenon. When I look at small companies, very often, 20, 30, 40 people, they work quite nicely together. It doesn't mean the boss isn't an idiot, but it does mean that they, they have a vibrancy that gets over some of the real problems of, of bureaucracy and corporate think that this is attesting to. So I, I've, as I said, I've spent the last five or six years of my career trying to say to myself, look, Management as we know it today isn't working very well. It's not very agile. The systems we've created don't allow us to adapt as quickly as we'd like them to, given the way that the world is changing. And at a much more micro level, management in the way that we behave as individuals is not making happy uh, and, and engaged employees. So there's something basically kind of problematic about the way that management happens, particularly in large companies. So I wrote my book, Reinventing Management, with a view to try to offer some helpful thoughts about how we could change the world of management for the better. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of the executive summary of that, that book over the next 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, it's useful to start with the following kind of framing device. If you say to yourself, what does the future of management look like? You know, there's two kinds of schools of thought here. One is that the future of management will be radically different to anything we've seen before. We are on the cusp of a great uh, change over an inflection point, if you like, in the way that management work is done. And we can point to various internet-based technologies to convince us of that. Or you can take the view that 
There's nothing new under the sun. That says, I don't see that management got anything out of those sensitivity training workshops. And the philosophy behind that is, you know, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, they did management as well. You know, human nature hasn't changed. Why would we expect anything about the way that management happens to change? And of course, I've got some sympathy for both camps here. Um, and, and let me just illustrate it in the following way, which is that if you look at the words we use to describe the work of management, this particular slide is borrowed from my old friend Gary Hamill, and he says, look, on the left-hand side, we see the kind of the classical word that describe what management does. What is management? Management's getting work done through others. It's about planning, organizing, controlling, budgeting, all that classical stuff. If you've ever taken any studies here or anywhere else about management, at some point, somebody has kind of given you that kind of dictionary definition of management as the stuff on the left. Now, of course, that's true at one level, uh, but it was also true 100 years ago. And you know, the, the management systems that are sort of suggested by that left-hand side are more than one century old. And a lot of these things are kind of have their origins in the Industrial Revolution. You look at the right-hand side, and of course, this is the language of the internet. This is the language of our children, uh, the social networking kind of generation. But it's not just how kids interact with each other through, um, through various sort of instant messaging services. This is also the sort of the, the language of management as practiced by, for example, the open source movement. The open source movement, you know, for example, Linux, Red Hat, Apache, organizations which have been created by volunteer labor forces uh, who are, through their own free will, essentially, collaborating, often across thousands of miles, having never met one another, to create software products which are every bit as good as what Microsoft or Google has to offer. And they are doing, through, as I say, through a set of mechanisms which are, broadly speaking, horizontal mechanisms rather than vertical mechanisms. Now, I don't want to overplay that distinction because if you go and have a look at the, you know, the, the world of Linux, you actually see some sort of hierarchy as well as some sort of horizontal mechanism. But nonetheless, the point is, arguably, we're at a little bit of a, a crossroads in terms of the way that management work gets done between the old world of, of, our, of our, our generation and our parents' generation and the new world of our children's generation. So what does the future of management look like? Well, it's going to be drawing from both of these sets of uh, ideas. It's going to actually be some sort of third way between the old and the new. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't want to lose all of the benefits, if you like, of the classical way of working that has stood us in such good stead for 100 years. But neither should we kind of, if you like, avoid the, the opportunity afforded to us by particularly new technology, by particularly the way that the next generation uses technology and communication devices to get work done through others. So that is my orienting kind of device. And, and it leads to, to uh, hopefully a useful perspective on the way that we as organizations can actually make better choices. Uh, this is the most academic slide. I think the next two slides are my most academic slides in the entire bunch. Um, so bear with me, please. Uh, you know what a business model is. You know intuitively what a business model is. It's the choices we make. It's our, it's our formula for making money. It's the choices we make about our cost structure, our revenue structure. So you take the classical case of the airline industry, uh, and of course here you have SAS and you have Norwegian. Back in the UK we've got British Airways and we've got Ryanair. Different business models ultimately competing in the same space. And that has been around as a, as a way of thinking about things for a good, a good decade, really since the dot-com explosion in 1997. Have you thought as much about your management model? Uh, you probably haven't. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've been trying to kind of contribute to the academic world is, is to think more carefully about what we mean by a management model. And my argument is the following, which is that if you're making choices in terms of your business model, your cost and revenue structure, you are also consciously or otherwise making choices about your management model, the way in which you get your work done. So we are, as I say, in any company, choosing a certain way of coordinating activities, certain ways of making our decisions, certain ways of make, motivating our employees. But the trouble is we often don't do it as consciously as we should. That is to say we fall back on the model that we have seen working in other places. We fall back on the model which we've seen our competitors using. 
So whilst there are choices to be made here, while every company potentially has its own unique management model, the reality is that most companies have gravitated over the years to what you might call a very traditional management model. And that traditional management model looks like this. What I'm trying to now do is to extract a set of underlying principles about how companies, organizations work that essentially explain some of those, those, those deep, deeply held assumptions. And I'm going to take you through this. I'm not, I'm not going to define all those words right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that historically, organizations, you know, from 100 years back onwards, have traditionally organized coordination through bureaucracy. And we all know intuitively what bureaucracy means. And those elements have become the sort of default management model, particularly of large organizations. What does the right-hand side offer us? It offers us a set of alternative principles. And I'm deliberately using the word alternative rather than new here. What I'm trying to say is that we have, perhaps through technological innovation, but perhaps actually through much more basic means, we have an emerging set of principles by which organizational work can happen that are giving us the opportunity to come up with different ways of making work happen in big organizations. The, the classical model is on the left, the alternative model is on the right. Uh, arguably, if you go to Silicon Valley, or if you go to any sort of high-tech city, uh, you see much more of the right-hand side than the left-hand side. But I would caution all of us to be, to be careful about saying that somehow left-hand side is bad and right-hand side is good. The argument's a bit more nuanced than that. The argument is that the left-hand side principles have served us well, they have pros, they have cons, they have benefits, they have costs. Likewise, as we start getting into some of these alternative principles, these are also alluring, they're attractive, and they have enormous benefits, but they also bring with them challenges and costs. And we must be careful, as I say, not to just throw out what has been useful to us in the past and embrace the new without thinking about it. The smart organizations, I think, are the ones that consciously say to themselves, on each of these dimensions, which, what's the right balance? What's the right balance between, shall we say, tradition and alternative? So I'm going to take you through each of these dimensions in turn. Some of them I'll do very, very quickly. Some of them I'm going to spend a bit longer on. We'll start with the top one, bureaucracy versus emergence. Bureaucracy is coordination through standardized rules and procedures. That's the dictionary definition. That's Max Weber from the 1930s. Is that a good way of coordination? Yes, it is, absolutely. Many, many big organizations have highly effective bureaucratic processes. The word is a bit tainted, but when Max Weber first, as it were, came up with this concept, he saw it actually as the antidote to allowing too much power to flow into the hands of one or two individuals. I'm just going to show you this brief video clip. It's about a 50-second clip uh, from... It wasn't me who took it, but I, 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 I travel in India. I'm sure several of you have traveled in India as well. Uh, just just have, a, have a look. It's not... Okay, I think you get the message. So, um, I mean, that's just an internet clip, as you've, some of you might even have seen it. Um, it's chaos, but it's chaos that works, right? I think you've probably guessed that's where I'm, I'm heading. Um, and for people like me, people like yourselves, brought up, if you like, in cities which have lots and lots of regulations and rules and order, this feels a little bit, make, it makes us a bit nervous, right? I mean, I've, I've, I've driven through places like that and I, I get very, very nervous. But, but there's, a, there's an interesting story to tell here, which is that inspired by 
examples like this, uh, a chap by the name of Hans Mondermann, you might have come across him, uh, he's been quite influential, um, instigated a series of experiments in, in essentially road design in Holland. And he persuaded a couple of towns like Drachten in the Northern Netherlands to try out his wacky ideas. And his idea was the following. He said, in order to make our road systems safer, we have to make them more dangerous. We have created systems which are so full of signs and lights and markings that, in fact, what happens is that, is that people stop thinking. They, they disengage their brain, and they find themselves locked in at these junctions where nobody knows what to do. They're waiting to be told what to do. And he said, if we strip out all of that, all of that stuff, all of those markings and lights and signs, and we create in its place a, a shared space. And that's an example of a shared space, where you can't quite see anything like as clearly where the boundaries between the cars and the cyclists and the pedestrians are. What, what that will do, of course, is that will create a sort of a change in responsibility from the people who design the system to the individual car drivers and pedestrians and cyclists. And if you are, as a car driver, approaching that intersection, and you don't have anyone telling you what to do and you see chaos, inevitably what you do is you take stock, you slow down, and you find a way of steering your way through that intersection without hitting anybody. Um, so that was his inspiration, and he rolled it out in Holland, and a number of other cities and jurisdictions around the world have also been inspired by this shared space thinking. And for me, it's just this beautiful illustration, almost like metaphor, for organizational life. So that the signs and markings and, and, and traffic lights in his world are the analogues to the management processes that we create in big companies. So our resource allocation systems, our budgeting processes, our systems for performance, appraisal, and management, our systems of compensation, all of these systems and processes are created by well-intentioned experts, human resources, finance, whatever, with a view to try to create order and control but all they, of course, end up doing is disempowering the people who are actually doing the work. Uh, and, and for me, this, this experiment in, open, in shared space gives us one very, very clear kind of principle, which is it's what's called less is more. In other words, when we have fewer systems, we actually very often end up with better outcomes as a result. And so for me, if, the, if there's an alternative principle to bureaucracy, it is this principle of emergence, the idea that coordination happens through the mutual adjustment of sort of self-interested parties. Now, how does that manifest itself in reality? I'll just give you one example. Uh, some of you might even have heard of the beyond budgeting movement. Stutter, for example, is a major contributor to that movement. Handelsbanken in Sweden as well. I mean, I've been following this beyond budgeting movement for a few years. This is just one example I'm very familiar with because I, I, was, I was working quite a lot with UBS a few years ago. And they, they said to themselves, if we are trying to grow our private bank, uh, and the biggest blocker to our growth is our budgeting process. You know, we could choose to kind of uh, tweak that budgeting process on the margin, or alternatively, we could just throw it out completely, get rid of our budgeting system, and replace it with a much lighter touch system whereby the individuals in various different parts of the world are free to set their own budgets, essentially, to choose how much to invest, how little to invest, as long as they are accountable at the end of each year for their performance, their return on investment, then we have enough control. But we're not going to hold people accountable to some sort of centrally created budget. And we're not going to reward them against that budget. We're going to reward them against their actual performance. So lots and lots of examples like that. I'm not going to um, go through any more. Probably in each of your own organizations, some of you have seen examples where taking away management processes actually helps. So that's my first dimension, and that's the kind of the most tricky. Let me take you through the second and third quite quickly, because the second and third, frankly, are quite straightforward. Uh, the second is what we can call the decision-making process in big organizations. And, and, and intuitively, you already know what's going on here. We can make decisions through the hierarchy. I can make a decision which affects you as my insubordinate, and I have every piece of authority to do that. Or we can adopt a model which says that actually if you take the masses, the, 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 the wisdom of the crowds, the people at the front line of our organization, and you aggregate up their views, very often you can make much better decisions as a result of that collective wisdom. And this is manifesting itself in all sorts of places. And you've all got your own examples. I, I think Wikipedia is, is still probably the, the, the ultimate example of knowledge bases 
accumulated together in a single place to sort of provide a repository of information that we can all use. I think the, the wisdom of the crowd versus the expert plays itself out very nicely in the, in the famous game show Millionaire. And you've all seen that show, I'm quite sure. What you can, if, you, if you're stuck on a question, you can ask the friend, who, of course, you choose because they're smart, or you can ask the audience. And it turns out that the audience gets the question, the answer right, nine-tenths of the time, whereas our learned friend gets it right two-thirds of the time. Now, the learned friend gets the tougher questions right. He or she gets the questions right at the end where they're, they're some obscure story in history or whatever. But the point is, depending on the question... You might want to have an expert answer it. You might want to go to the hierarchy. Or you might want to tap into the wisdom of the crowds. And so there's many, many examples of companies experimenting with good ways of using this kind of collective wisdom process. I'll just give you one example. I mentioned this company briefly earlier. Red Hat is a commercial organization which sells essentially services on top of the Linux platform. Um, and the, 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 the guy running it, um, he's... He's, he came from Continental Airlines, actually. Jim Whitehurst is his name. Uh, and he, he said, I'm going to now create an open, collective wisdom-based strategy process. It's not my job to define the strategy for this company. We are working in a networked world. I'm going to create teams of people who are cross-functional in nature, who are going to define the domains in which we're working and the priorities within each of these domains. And my job, essentially, is to pull those thoughts together and to come up with a strategy that we can all buy into. And as he says, this takes a whole lot longer as a process, but of course, once we've figured out what we're doing, the actual implementation of that strategy is a whole lot quicker. So, you know, many, as I say, many organizations have tried various ways of tapping into the wisdom of their people, either to come up with new ideas or to implement those ideas. It is not a risk-free process. If you've ever tried any sort of idea forum at your organization to try to, to tap into the views of the many, there are many times when it fails. I'll give you one example where it failed. This is B Obama's first term in office. So when he was first elected, before he actually took office, he had the bright idea of opening up a citizen's briefing book. And he said, let's use technology, let's use the wisdom of the crowds to get people to inform me about the policies they'd like to see me working on. So round one was he just tapped into anybody and everybody's ideas. And then he sorted out those ideas and he came up with a, a list, a shorter list. And then he asked people to vote for the ideas that they think they thought were most important for him to focus on when he moved into the Oval Office. Any ideas what was top of the list? Ending marijuana prohibition. There you go. Uh, then something about the, being a green country, something else about marijuana. Uh, something very, no, sex education, obviously important. Bullet trains. Number six, didn't quite make the top five, was to give the Church of Scientology tax-exempt status. So you see what's going on, right? Special interests prevailing. And, and you know, you could say, well, maybe that, these are the most important issues facing America. But, you know, in 2009, if you recall, he had some quite important challenges on his plate. You know, just a, you know a complete meltdown of the economic system. So, so you see where I'm going. I, what I'm, and the essence is that... Wisdom of crowds, the idea that we want to tap into the masses to hear their views, is a, is a blunt instrument. And if it's used badly, it often backfires. So this particular initiative was shelved. What he should, clearly should have done is thought much more carefully about the domains within which he wanted advice. If you ask a very broad question, you will get any number of completely flippant or useless or self-centered answers. So... Lots more I could say about that, but in the interest of time, let me, let me proceed. The third dimension, very straightforward, one of the oldest stories out there, which is that we have two basic choices that we can make in terms of how we motivate people. And this plays itself out at a macro level in terms of our own organizational compensation system, and it plays itself out at a micro level in terms of the way that you relate to individuals in your team. And the basic choice, of course, is between paying them for performance, you know, giving them extrinsic rewards, money being the most important extrinsic reward, or trying to find a way for the work to become sufficiently intrinsically interesting that people do it, as it were, because they want to, not because of the money. And this philosophy has, has echoed over the years. This is Douglas MacGregor. He called it Theory X versus Theory Y. And, of course, Theory X is a... Uh, th these are self-reinforcing 
philosophies. If you believe that people will only work if you pay them well, then almost certainly what you will get as a result of that is people who expect to be given more money if they work harder. And the whole investment banking community, as we know, fell into the trap of essentially giving people more money, the only result of which was expectations about even more money. Theory Y says, I believe in you, I trust you, I want to make your work as interesting as possible, um, and as a result, I'm going to relax the controls. And funnily enough, if that's the philosophy you actually believe in, you're likely to be rewarded with people who actually choose to work hard. And of course, you know, even though we know this right-hand model is superior, in other words, if you want sustained high performance, the right-hand model is undeniably the stronger one, it does turn out that most big companies continue to operate in a kind of left-hand side model. And there's an interesting disparity there which we can maybe explore in the, in the question and answer period. So that's all I wanted to say about the third one because, as I say, it's the kind of the oldest story out there. You've all heard versions of that over the years. The fourth is kind of interesting, and let me just spend a bit longer on it because a few of you are probably uh, puzzling over this word obliquity, which doesn't really exist. I mean, it was kind of made up about a decade ago by a, a, a fellow British guy called John Kay. He's an economist. And, and let me just backtrack slightly in terms of giving you the, the kind of the context here. If we want to define objectives for our organisation and get people to follow those objectives, the classical way of thinking about that has been the principle of alignment. And that is a principle so deeply embedded, it's almost unchallengeable. You know, the idea that we want people to be aligned around our organisation's goals is something we all subscribe to. And if you've ever looked at a balanced scorecard or if you ever talked about managing by objectives or cascading goals, all of these management tools are built around a principle of alignment. So I'm not going to say for a second that alignment is a bad idea, but what I am going to suggest is that it's not the whole story. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. And if you think about you know, the rowing aid is the classical metaphor, but many, many big organisations, people are not all rowing together. I was just yesterday with a group of executives from Roche, the big pharmaceutical company. You know, what is it that makes somebody work in the research and development part of Roche? Is it because they want to change Roche's share price? Of course not. They want to cure cancer. They want to you know, advance science. Their interests are not fully aligned with the commercial interests of the company, and neither should they be. If you work in a business school, we're always managing this tension between, as it were, commercial success, or at least you know, liquidity, uh, and trying to advance academic research. These things are not fully aligned, and neither should they be. So, how do we get around that? How do we come up with an alternative way of thinking about this? I settled on this concept of obliquity a few years ago, because I was, I was reading up on it, and I, I thought there's something puzzling but fundamentally profound about this concept. Obliquity is a principle that says that if you want to get to point A, you should actually, paradoxically, aim at point B. And what on earth does that mean? You're saying to yourself, how can that possibly be even half true? Let me just persuade you that it is true on the margin. In other words, there are situations where it really makes a difference. And I'm going to do it at the individual level, and, I'm, and then I'm going to do it at the corporate level. At the individual level, this is a quote from Viktor Frankl, famous Holocaust survivor, founder of a branch of psychotherapy. And he says, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. Because like happiness, success cannot be pursued. It must ensue as the unintended side effect of a dedication to a cause. Okay? What he's saying is, if you pursue a difficult and challenging and worthy goal, you are much more likely to be happy and successful, having gone through that difficult and challenging and worthy pursuit, than somebody who never tried to do anything worthwhile in their life at all. And that kind of philosophy has echoes at a corporate level, because I can, I can quite usefully define, di di well, di divide the world into two species of companies. Those like Exxon, who focus explicitly and narrowly on making money. And ExxonMobil does that very well. I have no problems with that. You know, they, they make lots of money whilst adhering to high ethical standards. But there are other companies out there, and Tata is a nice example. Tata is the big Indian group that owns Tata Consultancy, Tata Steel, Tata Motors, and so forth. Tata has a philosophy that our job is to improve the quality of life of the communities in which we serve. It doesn't mean we don't want to make money as well, but we have created statutes and rules and, and principles that ensure that we put a significant amount, I think it's 8% of our profits, into charitable causes, year in, year out. And because the family 
still has a sort of stake in it, they can kind of commit to that in, in, in an unamb unambiguous way. When studies have been done of companies like Tata, the visionary companies, it turns out that the visionary companies, the ones that are pursuing these higher order oblique goals, end up financially more secure, financially more profitable than the benchmark companies who have been pursuing narrower financial goals. Or if I put it the other way around, if all you ever do is seek to make maximizing your quarterly earnings for your shareholders, you will never take any risks. You will never put any money into anything worthwhile and your employees will not be as engaged and as a result you won't make so much money. So that is the, the kind of the, the concept of obliquity. As I say, I'm not trying to suggest that alignment is a bad principle. I'm saying that somehow the smarter companies are the ones that are blending the principle of alignment with this higher order principle of obliquity. So I'm, I'm going to move towards closing here. Um, how, given the way I've framed this, how can we do something about it? In other words, what can we as organizations do to become better managed, more fit for the future, using this framework that I've mapped out? It's quite easy, and I often do this in executive seminars, I, it's quite easy to get people to sort of talk about where they sit on those spectra. Are we more bureaucratic or are we using more emergent principles? Are we more hierarchically controlled? Are we using collective wisdom? But of course, diagnosing a problem is not the same as resolving a problem. So how do we then move from where we are today to where we want to be? The big sort of challenge that I've been grappling with with my Management Innovation Lab is how to get companies to be more experimental in how they work. And I use the word experiment advisedly. I'm deliberately working with companies like Roche yesterday to persuade them that what they should be doing is putting in place little management experiments to try out new ways of working. And I'll just give you one example from Roche uh, before finishing with a, with a story from a very different world. Uh, so a, a team of executives from Roche that I was mentoring, they, had this, they liked this idea of bureaucracy versus emergence. They, they liked this idea that we can re recreate the chaos of an Indian city within our organizations. So they said to themselves, we've got a really bureaucratic process. It's called expense claims. We have four or five hundred million dollars of expenses every year. Every expense claim has to be signed off by my boss. Even if I'm running a business, I've still got to get my boss to sign my expense claim form. So they said, what if we stripped away the bureaucratic way of managing expenses and replaced it with a very light touch peer review system? In other words, I spend whatever I deem fit. I put my expense claims, as it were, onto a spreadsheet for everybody to see. And frankly, that's it. You know, and if I'm spending money on stuff I shouldn't be, I will get my colleagues, my peers, looking at my expense claims and they'll be telling me that I shouldn't have done stuff. So the peer review, the kind of the concept that I'm accountable to my peers would drive the new expense claim process. They, because they're good scientists, they put in place a proper you know, experimental procedure here with the kind of the placebo drug and the, and, the, and the real drug. They had a control sample, they had a test group, they tried this new model in two factories, in one in Switzerland, one in Germany, and they had control groups with a standard sign-off process. And to their delight, and of course this is why I use this story, after four months, the test group, not only were people happier, you know, not only was it less expensive in terms of the people who were checking up on the procedures, they actually were spending somewhat less money as a result. And the reasons for that are, I'm not, I'm not going to get a chance to get into it in any detail, but by looking at each other's expense claims, they could actually make smarter choices themselves. Now, there's lots of issues with this design. If you're an academic, you're probably saying to yourself, that probably would not get published in a, in a top academic journal, and you're right. Uh, there may be a thing going on here called the Hawthorne effect, whereby people are behaving differently because they're being observed. All of which I actually don't care about, because the point is what we're trying to do is change behaviours in organisations through experimentation. And to the extent that we can do that through little manipulations like this, I think that is a good thing. So that's just one of about 50 or 60 experiments that I have been involved in helping Rush executives put in place. Many of them don't go much further. You know, this particular one uh, was very successful. It went to the next stage, as it were, of sign-off. And at some point, some bureaucrat somewhere in Rush said, I'm not rolling this out across the rest of the organization. So there are some challenges of implementation here. But nonetheless, the philosophy of experimentation works well. I'm just going to skip that example. So, in order to finish roughly on time, uh, experimentation is a philosophy that I fully believe in. Experimentation, we do it when we develop new products. We do it in the labs. 
we should do it more in the way that we manage. And as I say, over the last six years, my biggest kind of single academic pursuit has been to work with companies to document cases of experiments using these sort of principles of trying things differently in a low-risk way so that those changes start to get a little bit of momentum going in order to, as it were, change the entire system. So, I'm going to finish with a, a deliberately uh, very different story. Um, this is the men's high jump world record. Some of you will feel you know this story, but I'm going to give it a little twist. This is the height that men have jumped over a 100-year period, 1.95 meters at the turn of the previous century, up to the current record, which is somewhere around 2.5, 2.55 meters. What, what do you think is happening in there? I'm not expecting large amounts of audience participation here, but I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't mind if someone would shout out their expectations. This is Fosbury, thank you. That's the right answer, and it's the wrong answer. So, so have you, you've, most of you have heard of the Fosbury flop, right? The, the jump where Dick Fosbury was the initiator of it, where you jump over the bar, as it were, backwards, you know, spine first, rather than forwards. And you know, anybody looking at that chart will say to themselves, aha, it was the Fosbury flop that led to this dramatic growth in the world record. Well, it turns out it wasn't, and this is why it's an interesting story. So bear with me for a second. It turns out that this spurt in high jump sort of greatness came about because two guys, John Thomas, an American, Valerie Brumello, Russian, were kind of arch rivals. And if you can see from this chart, they're both using the old technology, the old method, which was the so-called straddle jump where you went over the bar chest first rather than back first. And because they were pushing each other, they managed to sort of nudge up the height quite successfully. And if you like, they kind of squeezed every last bit of juice out of the old technology, the old way of doing things. Now, interestingly, Valerie Brumel was the guy who, who, who got the, the most recent record there. The year after, just before the Mexico Olympics, Valerie Brumel had a motorcycle accident and could no longer jump anymore. He, never, he was never able to jump at the same level. So along came the Mexico Olympics, and this chap, Dick Fosbury, suddenly became a world-famous name. He won the gold at the Mexico Olympics. But, and this is where the story gets really interesting, you look at his performance using the so-called Fosbury flop, and it looks a bit like this. So go back to 1960, he was jumping you know, 30 centimetres lower than Valerie Brumel. He was a no-hoper. He was a joke. People were laughing at him for this crazy method of jumping over the bar. But he stuck with it, and he continued to, to push it and to, to en en enhance it and reinforce it. And eventually in the Olympics, because Brumel wasn't there, Dick Fosbury, with his flop, won the gold medal. Uh, and, of course, he didn't beat the world record. I mean, he was a good three or four centimetres lower than what the world record was, but that didn't matter. This was the, the big world stage. And suddenly, at that point, of course, people started to take him seriously. And what happened in the years thereafter is you can see that the red dots are the old technology, the old straddle jump, and the green dots are the Fosbury flop. It wasn't Dick Fosbury himself who ended up getting to that higher levels, but people who then imitated his style were the ones who took the... The, the, the record to the highest level. So you've got a fascinating story of different eras, if you like, of what you almost call it technological development in the high jumping industry. Uh, the Fosbury flop is fascinating because for many, many years it just wasn't as good as the straddle jump. Uh, but eventually it became apparent that it was. And what's that story got to do with my story today? Hopefully it's clear, which is the following, which is that the process of changing the way that we work in big organizations is, is fundamentally difficult. That is to say, we're also very accustomed to our old way of working. The new ways of working will often actually be less good in the short term than the, they become in the longer term. And so if you are a kind of a management innovator, if you're the sort of person who's trying out new ways of working, you know, you feel an awful lot like Dick, Dick Frosbury did in 1964 and 1965. People are looking at you and saying, that'll never work, that's a crazy idea. You know, this is a much better way of doing things. But if the underlying capacity of that technology or a way of working is superior, and if you stick with it, ultimately 
uh, kind of prevails and takes over. So, you know, this, if you've ever studied technological evolution, this looks an awful lot like, like disruptive technology thinking, uh, and it is, uh, but it also applies very much to management evolution and management revolution as well. So I'm going to close there. I've got a rather corny way of finishing, but I'm going to try it anyway. Which are the companies that are fit for the future? Uh, well, for me, it's the ones who are prepared to, to be like Dick Frosby, the ones who are, are prepared, if you like, to try something different, to, as it were, rise above their competitors. And above is a convenient acronym whereby AB stands for anti-bureaucratic, emergent behavior. O stands for open rather than sort of hierarchical. V stands for is like visionary rather than short-termist. And E stands for experimental. So with that, I will say thank you very much, and I hope this was useful.